The book of Romans, chapter 12, and verse number 6. And I'm going, to, I'm going to be a bit more teacher than preacher tonight. My dad used to say that preaching was teaching in high gear, and teaching was preaching in low gear. I'm going to, and normally, those of you who've been with us in the past, you know that I can get blood and guts when I preach. In, in fact, uh, if, I, if I can share this, and I hope you understand my heart on it, we were in, in New Zealand, and uh, I'll share a bit along that line maybe another night, but one of the pastors there said to us, he said, you know, he said, of all of the people from outside New Zealand that have ever come into this nation to minister, he said, who, under whose ministry I have personally sat. So we'll put, we'll put the boundaries on that thing. He said, the ministries I personally sat under, he goes, I think, he said, that probably you and Linda carry more of an anointing in the area of bringing conviction than anybody else, he said, that we have ever had in this nation. He said, it's just something that when you come and, and, and you begin to minister, it's just like there's something from the Holy Spirit that comes. I expect that again tonight. Even though I'm going to be a bit more teacher than preacher, for some in this room, that perhaps you are not at the moment living where Jesus wants you to live, you're going to, you're going to sense conviction. A conviction does not have to always be a heavy thing. Now, it can be. I have, I have had conviction drop into meetings like a curtain, just... And, 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 and people who said, I know I'm saved, but I feel like I'm going to hell. And, uh, and sometimes conviction can come to the point that I tell people, there have been nights the conviction has been so strong that it scared me, and I was preaching. But there have been other nights that just so gentle. And, and just two weeks ago, I was preaching at a church, and, and that evening I had, I had uh, not been really going after the lost. I had felt that I had a, a word of encouragement to the church body. But right at the end of the message, Pastor, the whole atmosphere changed. I mean, just like that, the whole atmosphere changed. And I just told them, I said, I said, right now a change is taking place. As some of you feel, I said, there's a change that's just coming to this atmosphere. I said, conviction of the Holy Spirit is coming into this place. And said, there's some of you in this room that you're away from Jesus. And I said, and right now, conviction of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I said, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give an altar call. I said, but I'm going to do it different. I said, normally, I said, I would ask those who want to give their lives to Jesus to, you know, identify themselves separately. And I said, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to invite everybody in the room to come, and we're going to stand at the front, and we're going to be worshiping the Lord in a moment. And I said, and then I'm going to come and just be praying for people. And I said, and when I get to you, you just tell me, you know, that I'm that individual that needs to get right with God. And there was a young lady. I knew who she was. The Holy Spirit told me that. And she came, and she was standing right about there. And when I walked over to her and, and, and just began to share with her, and, you know, do you come to church here? No. Uh, I came with my sister tonight. I said, may I ask you a question? Yeah. Have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ? Are you living for him right now? No. Would you like to? Yes. She was the one. The Holy Spirit conviction had simply fallen. She, I didn't need to argue her into anything. The Spirit of the Lord had already drawn her to himself. All I had to do was say, okay, well, come on. Let's open the door and come on in. Even tonight, there will be some of you who are going to have the Holy Spirit begin to talk to you about the fact he has so much more planned for you than you do for yourself. Can I tell you that God's plans for you are bigger than your plans are for you? I'm, they really are. Had, you know, I had no idea that God's plans for me would have included some of the things that have happened in the last decade in our life, some of the things in the last few years in particular that we have found ourselves involved with in places we have ministered. Some, you know, and, and, and we've been to Vietnam a couple of times, very much an underground church. I've given salvation invitations in the Philippines. I've seen as high as 900 respond to one invitation and as high as 300 filled with the spirit in one service and since then i would guess probably eight ten times at least 100 baptized in the holy spirit i would not have known that that but god's plans were bigger than my plans 
Now, you may not be somebody that has a preaching ministry, but God's plans for your life are bigger than your plans. There are some of you that God probably has a plan to tap you on the shoulder and say, I want to redirect your future, and uh, I want to use you in ministry. And that may happen even this week that God will speak to some of you. spoke to a young man a couple of weeks ago and called him into ministry. Well, by now you found Romans chapter 12, verse 6. Would you stand with me, please, for the reading of uh, just two verses, Romans 12, 6, and then 1 Corinthians 12, 10. Romans 12, 6, in the King James, says this, Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And then go, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 10. It's right-hand page, right-hand column, bottom of the page, uh, 1,081. <laughs> and I read this statement, verse 10, To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. I was not going to go in this direction, but, but even while we were worshiping, I just began to sense a stirring. And while I was standing here and, and debating in my own heart, I continue to feel just a stirring to go this way. And um, I'll know in a, in a few moments if it was the Lord or not. But would you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, Open my heart that I may hear what you would say to me. Change my life. Make me more like Jesus. In his precious name, amen. You may be seated. I was speaking to a pastor some time back on the subject of prophecy. Particularly, we got addressing the subject of personal prophecy. Some of us in this room, maybe most of us are familiar with that event in a church service where there is somebody who stands and speaks a word by the Lord and, and we call it a prophetic word that comes to, to bless the church. And I'll come back to that in a few moments. And, uh, and many of us are at least somewhat familiar with that. It's been somewhat more controversial when that particular thing begins to happen in a one-on-one -on -one situation or perhaps at an altar where somebody's on the receiving end of a personal word. And this pastor and I were in conversation about the subject of prophecy. And about seven years earlier, he had been diagnosed with cancer, terminal cancer. And uh, he had been told that he would not live. Now, he was, at that point in time, he was uh, probably in his early, early 40s. Uh, he had uh, a... a teenage daughter, upper teens, and had a, another daughter uh, just coming to junior high school age, maybe a bit younger than that. And he was being told that he would not live to see them graduate from high school, and this was terminal. And, and you can imagine some of the stuff that was happening in the life of the church and his life with that happening. While he was in that, he said that what, what happened, long story short, to get to, to the end uh, of the story, God healed him. And he's living today absolutely with a clean slate. They, they say that they can't find any cancer anywhere in his body. But he said that during the dark days, during the time after he had been diagnosed with the cancer, before the healing took place, before there's any evidence of healing taking place, when his condition, when his condition was continuing to deteriorate, that it was prophecy that enabled him to survive that he received several valid words from the Lord that undergirded him. It was those words from the Lord that gave him something that he was holding on to, that built faith in his heart uh, that God had everything under control in his particular situation. Now, even as I would speak this to you tonight, his church is still struggling numerically. It was a church that experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit about... Uh, probably eight, nine years ago, and as happened in some churches with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, some people did not know what to do with that. You see, there are moments when God pours out His Spirit in what we call revival, 
And there are churches that embrace that. They say, yes, we want that. But sometimes God pours out His Spirit and some things happen that are outside what church has been like. And sometimes when that happens, not everybody's comfortable with that. Now, sometimes it's good people who really do love the Lord, but they simply don't understand what's going on, and so they back off. Sometimes it's individuals who should know better, and they just have a hardness of heart. I don't know what the case was in his church's situation, but I I had been there during that time of the outpouring of the Spirit. I knew it was a genuine thing. But they went from about 150 in a Sunday morning attendance until their numbers began dropping down to about 35, maybe 40 people on a good Sunday. But he says to me, not only has the word of the Lord given me strength when I was going through the time struggling physically, he said, it's also been an incredible encouragement to me concerning the future. He's one of the most positive, upbeat individuals I've ever spoken to. In the midst of a situation when the church has been running the other direction, he has this incredible sense in his heart uh, uh, that which God is going to do uh, because of the words of prophecy. So for him, personal prophecy has been an incredible blessing in his life. The same time I was talking to this pastor, I was engaged in ministry to another former pastor who was very discouraged, who at, the, at, the, at that moment in time was struggling with bitterness and was hanging on spiritually by his fingernails. He had been devastated by the way he and his family had been treated by the church that he had built from 25 to around 200. He had become disillusioned and was feeling like God had let him down. A part of the issue for him was the many prophecies about the great growth that the church was about to experience uh, and how God was going to bless the church and bless His ministry at that church. Then a major split came, and he was asked to leave the church. And so here now, a few years after that fact, struggling. So for the one pastor, the personal prophetic word has been a great source of inspiration, encouragement, blessing, and help. For the other pastor, the prophetic word that he had received, that his church had received, has become something that's brought disillusionment, discouragement, despair. Many of us in this room, if we cannot identify with one of those two, are somewhere between them. Some of you in this room have been on the receiving end of operation of the Spirit. Maybe somebody saying, I think I have a word from God for you. And in some cases, uh, you have just really struggled with what they said God had for you. In some cases, you maybe even begin to move upon something that somebody else said. uh, And as a result uh, of what you did, things went in a tailspin. How am I to respond to prophecy? What is the role it's to play in my life and the life of the church? In the message tonight, I want to examine this subject. Now, we're not in one session going to cover all the aspects of this important and fascinating subject. Entire books are written on it. What I want to tackle is this. What is prophecy? What about corporate prophecy? What about personal prophecy? And then I want to share with you how I personally respond to prophecy, particularly When I'm on the receiving end of somebody saying, I have a word from the Lord for you. At this point in time, I really have no idea how many times I've been on the receiving end of a word from the Lord. In fact, I tell people, I don't think that you can travel in itinerant ministry without experiencing that. That uh, there will be people who come to you who have a word from the Lord. My life has been, and I'll come to this later, greatly enriched and encouraged uh, by some words from the Lord. And I have heard some that I think there was too much pepperoni on the pizza. I have heard some that I don't think God had anything to do with. I've heard some that I believe were from well-meaning individuals who are speaking out the desires of their heart, uh, not the desires of God's heart. I have seen some that I think were speaking out of their bitterness, 
rather than speaking and bringing a word from the Lord. So how do you respond when somebody says, I have a word for you? Well, what is prophecy? Well, in, prophecy is one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that are found mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14. Its purposes are explained in the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning in verse 3. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified, New International Version. Three things that are to take place when prophecy is happening. Number one, strengthening. King James says edification. That is to promote another's growth in Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, and holiness according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon. That the word means to promote the growth of somebody else in their walk in the kingdom of God. The root of the word for edify is also the same base used of architecture, of building, a building. So the first purpose of prophecy is to build one in the Lord. Now, that will deal with a lot of things that people may say to you that are not intended to build you up in the Lord. You ever heard somebody just kind of come along and just blast you? And then they put God's name to it at the end somewhere? I was in a meeting one night, and um, actually, it was, yeah, it, was one, it was one night in a meeting and there was a, a prophetic word that was given, a powerful word, you know, you know uh, basically calling us to prayer and, and just kind of a you know, good, solid word. And then there was another word that was given. And if I were to summarize the second word, it basically said this. I am the voice of God to this church, and you are not listening. Didn't come from the pastor. It just came from a lady in the church. Now, it, she was a little longer than that. I, I gave you the edited version. And, and she went on this thing, and, and I don't have time to tell the whole story. I'd be glad you were not in the meeting that night. It was, um, my son asked me, he said, Dad, why is it that all the, all the fun happens when I'm not there? You know, they, they weren't in that service that day. They were at a camp, and we just had one of those services you like to forget. And, I mean, stuff happened that should never take place in the house of God. And I ended up later that week in a board meeting uh, to about 3 o'clock in the morning with the pastor and the board of his church, and they were dealing with what, with what happened in that service. And, and at one point about this prophetic word, and I said to the board at one point when they finally you know, asked me for my input, I said, you know, I said, without thinking, I can give you at least 12 things that lady said that were unbiblical. I said, that's without thinking. I said, give me a chance to think on it. I can come up with probably another 12 things that were not biblical. I said, but one of the things that strikes me, he said, the whole underlying tone of the message, it wasn't to build up. It wasn't to comfort. It wasn't to strengthen you. It wasn't to cause you to be encouraged. She was blasting the pastor. That was the whole essence of the word. She didn't come to bring a word. She, she was taking target practice. You see, often... When you begin to examine what is it that this word is doing. If you're on the receiving end of a word that the intent of it is to basically tell you what a horrible, terrible sinner you are. Unless it's coming from a recognized prophet, forget it. It wasn't from God. Now there are times in the Old Testament that God did send the recognized prophet who delivered a very strong word. But you see, if God... If you're ever going to begin to bring that sort of word to somebody, a word of that type of warning, and by the way, nearly always in the Scripture, not always, not in Jeremiah's case, but in most cases, when that warning came, there was also a way to get out of it, to repent, to change. 
God is not likely to take the person that sits two rows away from you who is you know, about the same level you're at spiritually and bring them to you with this incredible word from the Lord with thunder and you know, lightning flashing and all sorts of stuff breaking loose. If you don't in the next 30 seconds do what they tell you to do. Now, that's not normally the way in which God operates. In the New Testament, the primary purpose of prophecy in the life of the believer was for strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. The word for encouragement comes from a Greek word which is related to the word for paraclete, which means to call to one side, to help you, to help you. And number three, to comfort. Any address, whether made for the purpose of persuading or of arousing and stimulating or of calming and consoling. That's what Thayer says it means. It's for the purpose of persuading, consoling, stimulating, calming an individual. So there are moments the Scripture teaches that God will speak to His church today through the prophetic word. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29... We are called to judge prophecy. Let's see what it says. Let the prophet speak, two or three, and let the other judge. So when somebody comes and says, I have a prophetic word from the Lord. This is a word from God, and you can't judge it. They just told you it wasn't from God. Because the scripture says that you have always have the right to evaluate a word that purports to be a prophetic word. I can't say I do this every time, but frequently. It's one of my targets. If I feel like God has given me a, a, a prophetic word. Now, I, I'll do a lot if I have a word of knowledge. feel like God's given me a word of knowledge. I'll say to an individual, you're free to judge this. You're free to evaluate this. You know, you're free to see if this bears witness in your spirit. I'll come back to that in a moment. But I want them to know right up front that just because I believe something is a word from the Lord does not mean they're under obligation until they too have been before the Lord. You are free to evaluate or to judge. You see, God does not operate under the system of condemnation and pressure. There's some people who come and say, I have a prophetic word. If you don't do this thing in the next 35 seconds, God is about to strike you dead. Relax. You're not going to get struck dead in the next 35 seconds. You know, that's, that's not going to happen, okay? It's not the way in which God would have spoken to you many times before on that subject in your own heart before He ever gets to the point of sending the prophet to say it's over. Okay? But there are some individuals who, they, they, in fact, I had a dear lady in my church. I loved her. I was her pastor. I loved her. But she would come to me, and she would have an idea something we should do. And so I would listen to her idea, and, and I would say, okay, thank you. And then I would decide if we should do this. If I did not buy her idea, she would come back in two weeks. Thus saith the Lord. It would be exactly the same thing she had said two weeks earlier that we've already prayed about, discussed with the leadership, felt convinced in our hearts this was not at that point in time the direction that we were to go. Not a thing had changed except the fact she's adding some muscle. I mean, because how do you say no to God? You know, I mean, it's somehow when somebody says, you know, thus saith the Lord, you are to do thus and such, it's a bit difficult to say, well, I'm not really sure about that. Scripture gives you the right to judge prophecy. Well, how do you judge it? Let me give you six suggestions, okay? Number one, all judgment must be biblically based. I do not judge a prophetic word on the basis of somebody's appearance. In fact, one individual tells a story of being in a meeting at the close of the meeting. He's standing with his eyes closed, he's worshiping, and there came this prophetic word that he thought was, man, that was just a powerful, powerful prophetic word. And after the meeting, a friend came up and said, did you hear that word that that lady gave? He said, well, well yes, I did. He goes, he said, that could not have been from God. He said, well, what do you mean it could have been from God? I thought it was a wonderful word. 
Didn't you see what she looked like? He said, well, actually, no, I had my eyes closed. Didn't you hear what she said? How could I hear what she said when I saw what she looked like? Now, maybe we could talk to the prophetess about, you know, mannerisms and things that she could do to make the word of the Lord be easier to be received. But you see, this guy was judging not on the basis of content, but on the basis of personality, on the basis of physical appearance. And so when I say biblically based, I'm not talking about do I like their looks, but as I'm evaluating that which has been said. God, when He speaks by the Spirit, will never contradict something He's already said in His Word. Now, this was not a prophetic word, but it still is in the same general area. We had a, a pastor and wife who lived down the street from us, became good friends. We were roughly the same age. Our kids were the same age. We played basketball together and softball together. And I preached in his pulpit. He preached to my pulpit. We, you know, we were good friends. Their marriage got into trouble. In fact, their marriage fell apart. And as my wife and I were attempting to minister into the situation, this dear pastor's wife said to me, I have prayed about this. I have the peace of God on this. Uh, I have heard from God. It's okay for me to divorce my husband. Now, Scripture does give a biblical ground in the case of adultery for divorce. There is at least a line of thinking, a line of argument that Scripture gives biblical basis. If it's abandonment where the one spouse has disappeared, walked out of the marriage, and you don't know where they're at, and, and God has said you're not in her. Neither one of those was in occurrence. The husband is working hard to restore his relationship with his wife. There has been no adultery on his part. There's been none on her part, though it was close. There was no biblical basis. And so I'm, I'm challenging her when she says to me, this is the will of God. And she said, but I have the peace of God. I prayed about it, and God spoke to me. And I said, no, he didn't. And that wasn't being cocky. I said, no, he did not, because God is not going to violate his word. And he's already spoken in his word on this subject. I said, you do not have the peace of God. What you have is the deadness of your spirit. You have the calm that comes after a decision has been made. Did you ever wrestle with a decision? Just wrestle and wrestle and, and you finally just make the decision. And after you make a decision, there's a certain sense of quiet that comes even if it was the wrong decision? I mean, later events showed you made the wrong decision. But at that moment, you know, you felt quiet about it. You didn't have the peace because she had violated God's word. The voices she heard were not the voice of God. So when I say biblically based, number one, does the message spoken, is it in line with or contrary to the word of God and the, the general tenor of how God speaks in His Word. Number two, never violate the Word in your own spirit because of a word that somebody else has. Never violate the Word in your own spirit. Somebody came to my father when he was about 19, 20 years of age, had just given his heart to Jesus. He's excited about the Lord. And somebody comes to him and says, I believe God told me He's called you to preach. And my father's response was this. He said, that's nice. Now let God tell me. That was wisdom. Now the facts were God did call him to preach. But he already understood you never do something on the basis of somebody else's word alone. You never do something that violates what God's already put into your heart. You'll see, you may see this illustrated in the book of Acts in a very tough passage of Scripture. It's one that's caused a lot of us to struggle, where the Apostle Paul is on his way to the city of Jerusalem, and he is, and, and, and the prophet 
says to him, you know, brings in this girdle and, and, and binds it and says, the guy that owns this uh, is going to be bound like this, and it was Paul's. And, and the church sees it and tries to get Paul not to go, but Paul is persuaded in his own spirit that this is the direction God wants him to go. And he said, I'm prepared to not only be bound, but I'm prepared to die. Now, there's a lot of argumentation among the scholars whether Paul heard from God or not. I'll, I am not going to get into that tonight. I just want to observe this. Paul was persuaded in his own spirit and would not let the word somebody else had violate what God had told him. Now, if what God has told you is in line with his word, and you have a clear word from the Lord, and somebody comes with a word from God for you that's in disagreement with what God's told you, you're not under obligation to do what they said. Now, you may want to back off and say, Now, Lord, have I really heard from you? Lord, are you trying to get my attention? But just because somebody else says they have a word for God does not mean that they're always right and that you're wrong. Nor does it mean that you're always right and they're wrong. But I will not violate what God has spoken to me about doing. You see, I've had individuals over the years who tried to call me to do a lot of things. But I haven't been called to do. Nearly, Pastor, not all of them, but probably half of the major revivals that we walked into. At some point, somewhere in the church said, I believe God's called you to come and move here. I, I had it happen ten days ago. A man said to me, he said, in fact, it was a week ago. It was, it, was, it, was even last, it was last week. A guy said to me, I believe that God wants you to come and live in our city. I'm glad the guy likes me. But God hasn't called me to go live in their city. I will not violate what God's already spoken to me about doing. So never violate the word that God's put in your own heart. Number three, this is something I say every time I hear or receive a prophetic word. It's, it's the same thing that Mary, the mother of Jesus, said. When the angels came to her and, and they began to share with her how she was going to become the, the mother of the Messiah. So I take the same approach that she took, and here's what she said. Be it to your handmaiden. I change it to servant since I'm not a handmaiden. Be it to your servant according to the will of God. In other words, there are moments that I've been on the receiving end of a word that I do not understand at that moment. But I will say, Lord, be it to your servant. Lord, I will submit myself to your will. Now, I'm going to judge the word. I'm going to, you know, is it biblically okay? Is it in violation of what I've already sensed in my own heart? Now, there are times that God will speak something, has spoken something to me that wasn't where I was ready to go at that moment, but it was a part of the process. For example, I was in a meeting, Nation of Canada. And uh, I was at the altar. I was not the speaker. I'm just at the altar. And uh, they were prayed for me. My eyes were closed. I have no idea who prayed for me. I fell down under the power of God. So I'm laying there on the floor, and somebody comes along and picks up my feet. And they said these words. This was 1997. They said, these feet will carry the gospel to the nations. My first response was, yeah, you got the wrong feet. You know, I don't do nations. But my prayer was, Lord, be it to your servant according to the will of God. A few months earlier, a lady had said to me in a meeting, she had stopped me. I'm just trying to leave a building. And this lady stopped me in this aisle, and she had a word from God. I'll give you the whole thing. But a part of it was, God's going to send you to the nations. And my response was, you miss God. But my prayer was, Lord, be it to your servant according to the will of God. Subsequently, I began to discover it was a word from the Lord. Principle number four, pray into the prophecy and then commit it to the Lord. You see, I do not go out of my way to try to make a prophecy happen. Again, the illustration in New Zealand that I started the night with. When somebody said, you are going to have ministry to, to in, in, in the... In the beehive. I did not go to New Zealand and set an appointment with the prime minister. Number one, I didn't really want to have an appointment with the prime minister. But I did say, Lord, be to your servant according to the will of God. And I did pray into that. Especially when I got the second word from a missionary who doesn't know about the first word. 
and he writes me and he says, I was praying today about you and for your ministry, and I felt this thing that, that I've been carrying in my heart. I just thought I should share with you that I believe when you go back to New Zealand that God's going to open the doors for you to be involved with people who are in government. You see, the scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And so when I received those things, what I then began to say, Lord, be it to your servant. I pray into this, Lord. I pray that this is your will, Lord, that you then open the doors in your own timing for this event to take place. I did not try to create it. In fact, in the overseas ministry, when that began to take place, I did not, I did not do anything to open any invitations that we received. Not to say they've been wrong to have done that in general sense, but since it was, it was a prophetic word from God, I said, okay, Lord, you're going to have to open the door then. You can make it happen. Now, while I, and, and, and principle number five, I do not try to make prophecy happen, but some prophetic words will require obedience. Okay, I don't, I don't, go, I don't try to make it happen, but there are moments that God opens the doors, and you know now I'm either going to obey or disobey. I'm either going to go overseas or not go overseas. I'm either going to say, yes, Lord, and respond to that which I believe the Spirit has said, or I'm not going to. You'll come to that point in your life. Principle number six, get good counsel from trusted spiritual people. Get good counsel. Scripture encourages us to get good counsel. Nothing wrong. In fact, my wife are in a process right now with some things in our ministry where we're doing that where we have been praying about some things. We have been on the receiving end of, 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 of prophetic words, but I've also been engaging some individuals that I have known for many, many years whose counsel I trust, and I've been saying to them, I want some input. In fact, I said to one the other day, I'm just, going to, I'm just going to share some things. I just want your input. Just speak to me because I want to hear good counsel because I believe if it's a God thing, good godly counsel and the prophetic word will come in agreement together, and there'll be a witness in my own spirit. Let me share with you, and I'm going to bring this to a close very quickly here, four things I never do on a word of prophecy alone. Now, there may be two or three witnesses that may do something on the mouth of the third witness, and I'll, I'll give you a story on that in a moment. But here's four things I don't do. I don't marry on a prophetic word. Okay? Okay? Just because so-and-so says, well, you know, God wants you to marry that person. Don't go buy the wedding ring. Even if they come and say, I have been much in prayer, and God has told me you're my future spouse. You may want to say, that's nice, let God tell me. If you're married already, that would be real complicated. And you may want to tell them, I think you're hearing the wrong voice. I don't buy on somebody's prophetic word. I don't buy something. You know, go out and, and, and spend a lot of money and buy something because somebody prophesies I should do this. I don't sell on somebody's prophetic word. I don't move on somebody's prophetic word. Now, having said that, it may be a part of two or three witnesses that may be a part of a transition that you'll go through in your life that may involve moving, may involve buying, may involve selling, but I never do it on an individual's prophetic word alone. I will not do that. Some prophecies serve to confirm. Some prophecies may be the attention getter, the first word before the second or third confirmation or witness comes. And you see, there are sometimes that there are things that somebody will speak prophetically to you, and it'll be a confirmation, illustration. This had me personal life. I'm preaching at this church, and the pastor gets up, and 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 I'm done preaching, and and uh, this was a week long prayer conference. But and I don't know why this particular night I had I guess it's because we had we had several ministry guests. That was what it was, and I was just doing a part of it. And so I turned the service back to the pastor and for him to go as he felt when he came to the altar. He gets up and he says, Now, Brother Live and Good is going to stand over here on this side of the building, and he is going to move in the gifts of the Spirit. He's going to minister in the gifts to you, in the word of knowledge and prophecy. I'm like, I am? You know, it would be nice if God would tell me that, you know. And, 
And so, but in, in, in obedience and, and submission to the pastor, I walked over there, and I'm thinking, God, this would really like better work because I don't have a thing. But I walked up to this couple, and I'm standing there, and I started to pray, and suddenly I began to sense something. I just on the inside, no voice, but on the inside, just an impression. And so I, I said, can I ask you a question? They said, yeah. I said, has God been talking to you about your house? Faith began coming about that point in time. And they began to share with me how they had been talking together, praying together about opening their home to serve as hosting individuals who would be coming from other nations into their church for extended times of coming to be ministered to. And they were feeling like God was saying to them, I want you to make your house a place where people can come and stay. And they said, when you said, has God been talking to you about your house? They said, that's all the confirmation we needed. So at that moment, the gift of the Spirit served as a confirmation for that which God was already speaking to them. Now, I have seen the Lord do that I don't know how many times. Times that I have said something to somebody that I'm thinking, that is the strangest thing. And had them say, that's precisely what I needed to hear. My wife could tell you there have been moments, and I, could, I have a love-hate relationship with prophecy. There have been moments in services, and uh, I don't know why, but I was thinking Eagle Creek in Indianapolis. I remember this happening some nights where, where God would give me, I'm praying for the altar, and God would give me a, 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 a word for that individual, or I would say, and I'd begin to ask questions, and, 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 and I would say to myself, shut up. You know, I felt like I am so far out in left field that they're going to need to send, you know, a rescue dog to find me. You know, I'm thinking just, and, and I leave the buddy kind of going, oh, man. I don't know. And my wife would say, man, people kept stopping at the table and saying, I can't believe what he said. Nobody knew that. Nobody knew I was going through that. But the very word that he spoke is the exact thing that God said to me two weeks ago. You see, it came as confirmation to them. It wasn't a word there to act on alone. It was confirmation. Let me show you how God did that in my life, okay? And this was one of those, uh, it had some fruitcake stuff, I thought, at first. I was preaching a meeting of a friend of mine whose name happens to be Mike. Last name happens to be Massey. And, uh, and I'm preaching for him. At the close of the Sunday morning service, a lady walks up to me, and she says to me, I believe the Lord has told me something I'm to tell you. Okay. She says, first of all, she says, while, while you were preaching, she said, there was an angel standing behind you. Now, I'll tell you, I have never seen with my eyes an angel. I've never seen in the spirit and seen an angel. I tell people other than the one that I'm married to. You're a little slow on that, church. But I know they're there. I know they're there because the Word tells me. There have been moments in meetings that I sensed they were there. There have been moments in meetings that I think they walk by me. There have been moments in meetings I think I walk by them. I can't say I felt anything that morning other than the fact that I felt like I struggled the whole time I was preaching. But she said, there's this angel standing behind you, and he said about you, your name is Michael. She said, I think you should start calling yourself Michael instead of Mike. And your wife should call you Michael. And I said, thank you. On the inside, no thank you. And I'm thinking, where in the world did... So after the meeting, I said to the pastor, who I remind you, his name was Mike. So I said, uh, tell me about this lady. And I described her. And he said, oh, I said, yeah. I said, uh, she's been in the church about 14 years and uh, been her pastor for 14 years. She's solid. You know, just solid lady, loves Jesus. She's faithful. She, why? So I told him what she had said. He said, wow. Said, she's never said that to me. So I, I never heard her do anything like that. I said, all I know is anytime she has come to me and has sensed 
because she had a word from the Lord. It's been, it's been pretty, pretty valid. She's you know, pretty good track record. I said, okay. I said, well, because you said that, I'll pray about it. Otherwise, I was just going to file that one and file 13. But I said, okay, I'll pray about it. And so I, uh, the next day I called an intercessor, a friend of ours. And I said to this individual, I said, uh, I really need to hear a word from the Lord on something. And uh, I'm not going to tell you any more than that. I will call you up in one week and see what the Lord has spoken to you. If he's spoken anything. I'm praying, but I don't you know, hear anything. So one week later, I called this intercessor and I said, has God spoken to you? No. Well, yeah, one thing, but it is so strange. I said, okay. I sat down. <laughs> What's that? His name is Michael? I said, yeah, that was it. And she's pretty excited, you know. She heard from God after. I'm like, oh, now, wonderful. Now I've got to change my name, you know. And so I said, now, Lord, I don't want to be obstinate. But you said in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And said, I had been Mike for years. My family knows me as Mike. My mother calls me Mike. My friends call me Mike. If I'm going to start this Michael thing, I'm going to get asked all sorts of questions. It's going to really sound weird. So if you don't mind, third confirmation. And so we trip off to another nation to preach. And uh, we are tag team speaking at a women's aglow. We're in the pre-meeting prayer time. Standing in a circle. The leader of the aglow happens to be an ordained Assemblies of God minister in that nation. And we're standing there and she begins to pray. And she says these words. I say to you, Michael. My wife and I went. Heads up, eyes open, just we're staring at each other. She's going on, you know, with this word, and then I'm praying, and nobody else is there just praying. We're just going. I listened, and the rest of the day she introduced me as Mike. In fact, she does not recall saying the word Michael. To this day, when we talked to her later about it, she does not recall saying the word. My wife and I heard it. Now, at that point, I got the message. You know, that was the third time, and it was very clear. And so I said, I don't know why, but from that day on, I began to sign everything Michael. And, you know, I don't get bent out of shape if somebody calls me Mike. I don't correct them or anything like that, but I just call myself Michael. I sign everything Michael. My wife calls me Michael. I even got my mother calling me Michael. Actually, she handled it better than I thought she would. But you see, what I, I share because I want you to see it was two or three witnesses. You do not offend the Lord when you say, Now, Lord, this word has come to me. And I need you to confirm this in the mouth of two or three witnesses. That does not dishonor the Lord because you're actually taking him at his very word and saying, Lord, would you do what you said in your word? You see, God will never begin speaking a word to you when the time situation is such that if you do not respond right now, you can never again have that opportunity. Not saying that that's not possible after about the third time. But I'm saying that God knows the future. He's not going to violate His word by suddenly having never spoken to you at all. Suddenly just say to you, the Spirit of the Lord says that you're to give that guy $100,000 and God will give you a million back and you have to do it in the next 30 seconds. And you said what? <laughs> yeah, right. You see, as soon as they put that, you've got to do this in the next 30 seconds. You've got to do this in the next whatever. No, no, now they've gone into manipulation. Holy Spirit does not manipulate. He motivates. He convicts. He does not manipulate. So if it was really God, He may, he may talk to you about giving something to somebody and may even give you a promise what He would do in return. But it's not going to say you've got the next 30 seconds. It will come in enough witnesses to your heart to confirm to you that that's what God wants you to do. So I don't do something on the basis of one person saying it to me. Now let me bring this to a close. Can I tell you one more personal story? Because the prophetic word has been 
both, at, on the one hand, a source of frustration for me. Can I be really honest with that? Because I had been on the receiving end of some pretty intense prophetic words. I've been on the receiving end of some pretty intense pathetic words, too. But I've been on the receiving of some things that had God stamped all over it. I've been on the receiving end of some things that, that the Lord has spoken multiple times. And it hasn't happened yet. Now in those moments, I made the call to believe that a whole bunch of people have missed God. Or called to believe that God is saying, you've got to stand on this one. That you're going to have to keep submitting this to me. That this is my purpose. As this is what I'm going to do. It happened again this week. Where somebody had a word from the Lord as they were praying for us in a situation. That I haven't heard, I've, heard, I've heard that word. But had not heard that word in a certain time frame. It suddenly it's like God was visiting it again. To speak that this is going to take place. Something I've told you was going to happen that has not happened to this point. Some of you may be there. And it can be a very frustrating thing for you to be trying to live out something when you haven't seen it fulfilled yet. At that moment in time, your charge is simply walking in obedience to the light that you already have. Because you see, some of the things that the Lord has spoken to me, and I'm not going to get to the other story, that God has spoken to me, there's no way that I can possibly fulfill them. I can't do it. Some of the things that, that I've been on the receiving end of, either God said it, and therefore He's going to have to do it, or there have been several individuals who have simply become excited and have spoken their own heart, and that can happen, where people begin to speak their heart rather than God's heart. And I have said to individuals, I want to be careful here, because I don't want to speak to you out of my mind. But I want to speak to you out of God's heart. There have been moments that I suspect I have been spoken to people out of my understanding. Rather than out of his heart over a situation. I will go ahead and tell you this story very briefly. Walking into revival. And one of the things God used to confirm to my heart the validity of what was taking place in that season. is As we were walking in, I had said to my wife. If this is of God, then there's three things I need God to do. I need God to, I need God to give me a fresh anointing. I need the Lord to give me fresh direction. And I need fresh inspiration. I, I said that on a Sunday morning, going into a service. In less than three hours, God began to drill me with the response to that. But three days later, standing at the altar in a meeting, and the individual was preaching, the meeting began to pray for me, and just began and stopped and began to deliver a word from the Lord. And, and I don't give you the whole word, but in the word, he nailed all three things. And the Spirit of the Lord said, there's a fresh anointing coming on you. He talked about you're in the center of God's will. Talk about what God was going to do in our lives in the next season. And then I was a basket case. And it picked me up off the floor. And, and, and then three, four days later, the pastor in that particular meeting prayed for me. And God gave him the same word. And then the next week, I'm in a meeting and somebody's praying for me and God gives them the same word. I'm a slow learner. But again, two or three witnesses. Week after that, I'm in another meeting in another different location. It's my rest night, and so I went to church. And you know, I've been preaching all week, night off, go to church. And this guy doesn't know me basically from a stack of bricks. Has a word from the Lord. And it is precisely the same thing that's been already spoken three times. Now, at that point, I'm beginning to get the message. And it's became an incredible source of inspiration and strength in my life. God never intended the prophetic to become the divisive thing it has become. He never intended it to become destructive in people's lives as it has become. 
Now, I've, I've not spoken to you about what you do when you give a prophetic word. I'll leave that for another time. But I've spoken about what you do when you receive one. You see, I don't want us to make the mistake that some have made of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because there have been things spoken that weren't from God. And there have been people whose lives have been messed up. Either because somebody spoke a word that wasn't, or they tried to make something happen that they shouldn't try to make happen. You see, when God's in it, you don't have to help God out. He doesn't need your assistance. And, and you do have to understand the whole thing of prophecy, that there's timing. There's application. There are moments it's a, a word from God, but you have to understand, how do I apply that? For example, the, the, the teenager who feels called of God to preach, and God confirms it. And maybe a part of the confirmation is through the gifts of the Spirit. It happens. I, I've been involved in that process. I've been involved in the process where I've said to young people, the thing that's in your heart that you believe that God said to you to do, it is from God. I didn't ask them what it was. I just had them come and tell me that they had been wrestling with feeling that like God was calling them to ministry. But just because that was a prophetic word did not mean they were to start preaching next week. There's an application and a timing to that thing. There's some maturing that had to take place in that person's life. You know, you, God can call you and speak to you and do some things in your life. That doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you're ready next week to go, you know, carry everything out. God called me to preach when I was 11. Thank God you weren't there to listen to me. You know, <laughs> nobody wanted me to be their pastor when I was 12. But God started me on a journey at that moment to prepare myself for what he wanted to do in my life. Now, I started preaching when I was 17. I, I wasn't pastoring. I started preaching to the kids' church. And then the youth group. And then the captive audience, the nursing homes. They couldn't go anywhere, man. You got them stuck, you know, right there. and They got to listen to you. So I learned how to preach, nursing homes. But the lady's saying, no, no. No. She didn't like any point I had. <laughs> you grow in it. You grow in it. Some of you perhaps have been on the scarred side. I don't want you to throw away that which is valuable. But neither do I want you to swallow everything that somebody says. I want you to say, God, help me to learn how to judge the prophecy and to hang on to that which is good to keep that which is valid as a part of my life it's a little phrase somebody gave me one day it says make war with the prophecies and there are times in prayer that has come to help me to pray God this is what you have promised and this is what your word says amen